Where the fuck did everybody go? Did, did nobody get the fucking memo? Nobody got the email? Nobody saw the commercial? Nobody knew that Raw was coming to Houston? My Amplified unit, much love and respect. Thank you for joining me for this Raw review and reaction. And before we get to the actual video, I just want to address that thumbnail that you see for this video. That is not photoshopped doctored that is a real legit photo from a fan last night in Houston Texas that is not a dark match that is not before the show you can clearly see in the upper right corner that's Drew McIntyre giving his promo which is in the middle of Raw that was Monday Night Raw's crowd last night WWE pulled their tricks where they pulled people from the camera side and put them onto the TV side so it looks like a packed house but I saw several times last night when that camera panned they couldn't even pan too much. When they pan just a little bit, you started to see empty seats. That's when you know it's bad, man. Then we see these photos. This is Houston, Texas. A hot WWE crowd. A hot wrestling crowd. And more than 25%, more than a quarter of that arena was not even sold for Monday Night Raw. You know by then they were handing out tickets. And they still could not pack that arena. And Xavier Woods, you tell me we're just complaining. You tell me it must be the holidays. You tell me it's a sign of the times. Tell me that, Xavier Woods, and I will call you one of the dumbest fucks that this world has ever seen. And not even your PhD can save you. That is showing you. That nobody even wants to shell out their fucking money to come see you. So you better, you better hope and pray that they're at home on the internet buying your stupid unicorn merchandise. And your stupid boxes of cereal. Because they're no longer showing up to see your ass. That is pathetic. And when the fans at home cannot get that fucking live, loud reaction from the crowd, because that's contagious. That rubs off on the people at home. That rubs off on us. And then you start mixing in your little fucking sound noises up on the loudspeaker. You're going you're gonna to put your own effects in there, right? Your own cheers, your own boos. That's going to be noticeable. We saw that down in WCW. It didn't work there. It ain't going to work here. It's only a matter of time. Before that 25 to 30% of the people not showing up to your arenas for your A show, supposedly. It's only a matter of time before that leaks to 35, 40%. Where does it end? 50%? Half your arena is going to be nobody there? Drew McIntyre was speaking to nobody. But that's okay, right? It's business. We're making money elsewhere. We're getting the other country. We're getting fucking uh, Saudi Arabia's money. We're getting all these other... We're getting a big TV deal. As long as people are watching at home. When people at home start seeing all these empty seats. Something is going to click. Fuck. Nobody's showing up. This shit must really suck. As much as we thought it did. It's one thing to see your ratings totally fucking dip. But to see your attendance like that... And we all made excuses at first. Oh, it's just live events. Live events never draw that much. What you saw in Houston, Texas for a Monday Night Raw... Just two Raws before pay-per-view... What you just saw... That was a live event crowd. But I was wrong all this time, right? The Amplified Man was just being negative. I was complaining. <laughs> Your ratings are gone. Your attendance is gone. You are right now milking the last of the Mohicans, if you will. The last of your fan base. You dwindled your fan base down so low, but now those are the diehards or the fucking legit casuals that are in and out every week, and maybe that's why you can get away with your half ass bullshit booking, is because it ain't the same audience every fucking week with your casuals, so that's understandable. But you milked it down to those dipshits and then your diehards, and your only bet 
is to milk as much money as you can out of us. And it's worked for now. But what happens as we just started seeing last week in Milwaukee and last night, especially in Houston, what happens when you hit rock bottom? What happens when you hit rock bottom? You just started it. The process has begun. I'm afraid to tell you guys, that's not actually rock bottom. It's only going to get worse. Turns out I wasn't wrong after all. Turns out I wasn't so negative. Turns out I wasn't just complaining. Turns out I was right. People are not digging this shit. People are no longer shelling out that money. I think that huge TV deal that Vince just got with Fox, I think that was the last big TV deal he's going to ever see again. If he doesn't turn shit around, I promise you. That was the last TV deal they got. It's just like NASCAR. NASCAR was dying a slow death, but they still got a huge television deal. Because everyone's train of thought is now in the production business is, you know what? People are watching more at home or on their laptops or on their fucking phones. So maybe live attendance might not be where it's at. Maybe it is now at home. But they don't have to go out. So NASCAR got that big fucking deal, and what happened? For those of you that don't watch fucking or follow NASCAR, what happened was they found out quickly, no, it was dying on every fucking outlet. From the phones, to the laptops, to the DVR. It wasn't just they stopped showing up, but they're gonna watch on TV. No, they found that out quick. Fox is gonna find that out quick. Their audience is dwindling to nothing. But I'm the bad guy. As I talk negatively, I wonder why. Was this show even any good? Let's get to the actual raw review and reaction video, guys. Let's get to that actual video, which again, I filmed this maybe two hours ago, bright and early. But I had to film this little intro once I got word that what I thought originally was indeed the case. The audience didn't show up last night. They had to move everybody to pack up that camera side, which is what they usually do anyway. But to see Drew McIntyre and to see those superstars go out there and perform in front of nobody on a whole side of your arena. That's fucking sad, man. That is sad. I remember going to events years ago and the crowd would not only be there, all of them, every seat filled, every ass in a seat, as Jim Ross would say, we wouldn't just be in the seats, we would be fucking raucous. We would be loud as fuck, enjoying the fuck out of that show. I miss those days. Now you're showing up to these shows, half the arena's not even there, or soon it's gonna be half the arena's not even gonna be there, and everyone's just gonna be golf clapping. You ain't getting raucous for anything. What are you getting raucous over? A Sasha Banks Q&A? Are you getting raucous over Drew's promo? Are you getting raucous over Tamina Snook on the main event? Are you getting loud? Are you excited? Let's get to the raw review and reaction video. The actual video. And let's talk about this in detail. Serious question for you guys. And I'm not... This isn't a... I'm just going to fuck with you question. This isn't a rhetorical question where I already know the answer. This is a serious question for you watching this. Not the other person, your neighbor, not the person in the next town from you, not the person in another country who's watching this video. You. How do you book the tag team division for the women? When they debut early 2019, how do you book the tag team division? Is there any way, consider this a two-part question, is there any way that this is not a failure? I ask these questions because if you think about it, the lead candidates for tag team champions for the women are going to be Sasha and Bailey, or at least that's what it looks like. Vince could change his mind and watch it be Tamina Snuka and Nia Jax. I wouldn't be surprised. But it looks like Sasha and Bailey, as much as I disagree with that decision, because I think Sasha should be on her own winning singles titles, all of them, for long periods of time. But let's just say, let's play devil's advocate and say, okay, Sasha and Bailey are going to be your champions early next year. Guys, think about it. They've already taken on every single tag team 
and every single female you can think of as a tag team on the roster. At least for the Raw ladies. The Riot Squad was a year-long fucking feud. They've already taken on Tamina and, and fucking Nia numerous times. Mickey James and Alicia Fox seems to be the new fucking pairing they have them against. Who's going to be left when they win tag titles? You're going to bring up a couple of NXT women over on Raw? That's cool. You'll have them face each other two, three, four, ten weeks? Then what? Do you maybe do a swap? SmackDown gets some ladies over there. So then the SmackDown ladies, now we're going to take on Sasha and Bailey. Okay, but for how long? Three, four, ten weeks? How does this not get redundant and stale because it already is and the titles aren't even there? So do you make them dual branded? That would be the only way to fucking do this, right? It would have to be cross brand. But now you're blurring the fucking lines. If you're going to do that with those championships, then you should just have one tag team championships as well. The men should only have one fucking tag straps. And I'd be okay with that. Because just like the women, the men's tag team division has already died. Everybody's calling it a slow death. It's dead. There's no reviving that son of a bitch. You gotta do something crazy, insanely drastic to revive that. Because all we're getting is the Usos in the New Day. Every fucking week in every pay-per-view. And then maybe every other pay-per-view they give that a, a fucking, some time off. And they have the New Day take on somebody else in the Usos, but then they bring them right back together because you can't go anywhere else. All they have over there is the fucking bar. I think they have Gallows and Anderson if they're even on, still on fucking SmackDown. But they don't do shit. They're not going to make them relevant for some reason. So that's all you have is the Usos and the New Day to go back to. Over on Raw, all you get every week is the Lucha Summer Underground Pinata Party. That Lucha Panada party versus the fucking Revival every week. That's your tag team division, guys. Revival and the Panada party. What the fuck? Uh, Smackdown, I don't care how many good matches they can put on. How many times do we need to see Usos in New Day? How many times do we need to see the Riot Squad, Sasha and Bailey, Or Tamina and Nia and Sasha and Bailey? Now, Mickey and Alicia... Jump them last week, last night we have a fucking match, next week there'll be another one. This is all before tag straps, everybody's all excited, oh my god, tag team titles for the women. What? Where does that lead us? My original question for you guys is if you're running the company, how do you do this? For the women, and make it fucking intriguing, make it exciting, make it fun every week. You don't have a fucking answer. The best you can come up with is, oh, it's going to have to be both brands. One tag title, Raw and SmackDown both competing so all the females are eligible. If you don't think we're going to run through that roster in the first six months, you got another thing coming, man. We've already ran through the roster. The only thing that'll be intriguing is some SmackDown matches. If fucking Sasha and Bailey get the titles, then you could put together, okay, Asuka and Naomi for a month. Th then what? Then do they take on Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? <laughs> Fucking A, man. Take my money. I am so sold. I'm on the floor. This is a heart attack waiting to happen. That's excitement. Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose versus Sasha and Bailey. What the fuck? What do you have? Who else is even over there, man? Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair. They're going to be tied up, obviously, in, in singles competition for the main strap. I don't know. You bring up some NXT talents, I guess. Right? You bring up the fucking Kyrie Sang and the Io Shirai. And, and, and do they even belong in a tag team? Io Shirai should be on her own. Kyrie Sane should be on her own. The, the thought of them two together? Pretty badass, though. That's a tag team championship fucking team right there if you want to debut them. I don't know why poor Sasha's being punished in a fucking tag team. But... I, that that could be intriguing, you know? But then what happens after a month? Or even if you drag that out a couple of months? Io Shirai and Kairi Sane versus Bailey and Sasha. Okay, but then what? 
Then you gotta go back to SmackDown and hope that Naomi and Asuka are still together. But that's an injustice to them. That's criminal for Asuka to be stuck in a tag team in Naomi. So what? Do you go back to Sonya and, and fucking Mandy? Or how about we revisit a Riot Squad feud and then maybe down the line Tamina and Nia again? I hope you guys see where I'm coming from here, man. There's huge issues already with the tag team division for the men. Now they're trying to start something for the women. And we're already seeing redundancy at its lamest form possible. Last night starts off with the fucking women. I don't even know what it was. It was a schmaz. It was supposed to be Ronda Rousey and Natty versus uh, Tamina and Nia. And the Riot Squad come down. Ronda Rousey gets jumped before Ember Moon can eat, or I'm sorry, not fucking Ember, Natty even comes down. Is that the way it worked? No, that was the main event when Ronda got jumped. What the fuck happened, man? I don't even fucking know. Natty gets jumped by the Riot Squad is the end result. That's what I do know. The Riot Squad jumps fucking Natty, super kick or some shit to Natty's face by Ruby, and then they do a powerbomb through the table for, for Natty. So Natty's down and out. All the heels go up the rampway when all they had to do was attack Ronda afterwards. But instead, Ronda Rousey is attending to Natty, looking up the ramp with the mean mug. And that was that. So the match is delayed for later in the night, and Ronda has to find a new partner. So then we go into... Uh, we go to a commercial break. We come back, and there's another female segment. And this is Alexa Bliss doing another Q&A for Sasha and Bailey. Would be a cool concept if these weren't the lamest, most planted questions that you could think of. Even the fucking casual fan that doesn't have a fucking clue what's going on, which, don't worry casual fan, none of us that follow WWE have a clue what's going on anymore. So we're all in the same boat when it comes to that. But even the casual fan knows, those are plants. <laughs> Anybody who ever goes on social media knows nobody is talking about Sasha using Bailey. But the first question is some fucking nerd in the front row going, Hi, I'm really nervous, but um, Sasha, my question, or Bailey, uh, my question's for one of you. How do you guys feel about everyone talking on social media about Sasha using Bailey? Who's talking on social media about Sasha using Bailey? We're talking about Sasha getting the fuck away from Bailey so she could be her own independent boss again. Be an ass kicker. Be the legit boss, not a sidekick, man. That's what we're talking about. Ask that question. You talk unrealistic. If you're gonna throw up a layup, throw up a softball question, hey, I understand, man, it's fucking, it's your fucking show, you wanna keep it fucking lame, I understand, but keep it realistic, nobody on social media is actually into this storyline where they're going, Sasha's gonna turn on Bailey, man, I can't wait, this is exciting, they're gonna get tag traps, they'll lose them, Sasha will turn on Bailey, who's planning that far in advance, nobody gives a fuck about Sasha and Bailey, I love Sasha Banks, you guys know this. It pains me to say that. But nobody gives a fuck about this. There was a moment in this Q&A where Sasha literally goes, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm here with Bailey. there ain't no turn, and we're gonna be tag team champions, and we're gonna be a tag team forever, or something. She literally goes forever, or for eternity. And I just cringed. I'm like, no! <laughs> Don't say that. Don't put the dagger in us, man. Sasha Banks goes, we're going to be a tag team for life. And I'm like, wow, man. I hope not because we actually want you to have a good career. <laughs> we want you to prosper and expand and fucking do great things. We don't want you to be with your best friend in a tag team for ever. So these Q&A questions, they were just pissing me the fuck off, man. The plants, their acting is... I know I'm extra harsh because I'm actually an actor here in New York City, right? And I fucking do a lot of acting. I've done a lot of acting. I'll continue to do a lot of acting. I'm doing a fucking movie right now. That one day will be finished. So maybe I'm a lot more critical when it comes to the acting performances. But evidently, Houston doesn't have great fucking actors. 
because that was traumatizing. Horrible acting. The questions were sol solidly fucking horrendous. And the, the answers from Sasha and Bailey equally cringeworthy. The whole segment fell off the rails even more than last week, if you could believe that. And then fucking Dana Brooke, Mickey James, Alicia Fox, they all come down the ringside. And Alexa Bliss holds them off and goes, no, 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 no. What we'll do is we'll have a match. Dana, you can stick around if you want, but Mickey and Alicia, you're going to have a tag match right now with Sasha and Bailey. So that's what we do. All of that was just to lead to Sasha and Bailey versus Mickey and Alicia Fox. Okay. Um... I can't tell you how many times Sasha Banks has defeated Alicia Fox, whether in a tag team or fucking individually, but here we go again. It didn't take long, within five to ten minutes, if that, where Sasha Banks gets a backstabber into a belly to belly, and it's a one, two, three for Bailey and Sasha. Okay, at least Sasha gets a fucking victory. Thank goodness she's not losing the fucking Alicia Fox. But what does it do? What was the whole entire first half an hour to 45 minutes all about? They dedicated the first half an hour to 45 minutes for the females. And what did it do? The Riot Squad jumps Natty again. Okay, same storyline I've seen for two fucking months. Sasha and Bailey are in another useless fucking segment that leads to another useless fucking match. What did it accomplish? Nothing! That's a question I don't need you to answer because that's rhetorical. I have the answer. The whole first half an hour to 45 minutes issued nothing. No significance for the future. That's the truth. Hard to fucking watch is it? aren't even the words for it, man. That was beyond hard to fucking watch. The whole first hour of Raw left a bad taste in my mouth. I was literally fucking frustrated that they didn't learn, learn their lessons from last week. And there's a real issue when you do not listen. Everyone likes to say, oh, they don't listen to the fans. Are you, are you fucking naive? They don't listen to fans, man. They're making the money and this and that. That's the issue. How do you not listen to your fucking base? We're trying to tell you something sucks. So what do they do? They either do the same thing the following week out of a troll job, they're just trolling, or they literally don't listen to their, to their fans. Because that segment bombed. But hey, Sasha wins a match, kinda, sorta, Bailey won it. Don't worry, BC, it's leading to something cool. Tag Team Straps! Woo! That's when this is really gonna get exciting! Then we'll see the, the Riot Squad versus Sasha and Bailey for Tag Straps for the next six months. At least it's different, BC! The titles are on the line! Wow! Titles that they had to make up because they had nothing for half these fucking females. Or 90% of them. Or 99% of them. If your name ain't Alexa Bliss or Charlotte Flair, you ain't getting shit. Becky Lynch had to fucking earn that the hard way. I call that the Stone Cold way. Where he literally, or the Daniel Bryan way. Where he literally had to get all the fans to get behind them in unison. Otherwise, Vince wasn't giving Becky Lynch the time of day. Fuck no. Becky Lynch would be in a tag team over there on SmackDown right now. I'm telling you, just like Sasha is. Now I'll get to the main event, because there was a lot more to go over in Raw. Let's just get right to the fucking main event. Let's stick with the females. So because of the earlier attack on Natty, Corbin says, or Alexa Bliss, I should say, she's leading the fucking Raw women. There's a fucking joke. There's a laugh for you. Alexa Bliss says you're still going to have the fucking tag match, and Ronda has to get a partner. So Ronda Rousey finds Ember Moon. So the main event of Raw is Tamina Snuka, can't make that shit up, Tamina Snuka is in your main event of Raw in 2018. Tamina and Nia Jax versus Ronda Rousey and Ember Moon. Okay with that match, actually. If it's, I don't know, in the middle of Raw, what the fuck?
fuck does that tag match have any significance in the main event for? Nobody cares about Rousey and Jax at TLC. Not like they do Becky Lynch, Charlotte, Asuka. And you're giving us Ronda and Nia over on Raw. Like we give a fuck about Nia Jax. Her heel heat, her nuclear heel heat, that big time heel heat everybody was talking about, it's already gone. It's already gone. I tried to tell you this from the beginning. Nobody gives a fuck about useless, reckless talents like Nia. You didn't want to listen. Looks like I was right. Where'd that heel heat go? Gone. Now she's just back to being lame Nia again. Who's just reckless and careless. Wow, the Amplified Man was right again. So in your main event, you got fuck at least Ember, Ember Moon... <laughs> You'd say, BC, I thought you'd be happy. Ember is not only getting time, she's in the main event. Out of nowhere, with no story fucking told, Rhonda just needs somebody. Last second, she picks Ember. This isn't getting me any more excited for Ember Moon's trajectory through the WWE. Because who's to say next week she's even on Raw? This could just be process of elimination. Who else was left? Ember was the only logical choice. I bet you Vince McMahon was pained to have to choose Ember. So I got to see an eclipse. I got to see a little bit of Ember. I got to see Ember celebrate a victory, kind of. The camera was mostly focused on fucking Nia, mean grilling to Ronda because that's the TLC match. But that was your main event. There was nothing shining here. Nothing at all came across as fucking epic. I love Ronda Rousey, you guys know that. But nothing in this match screamed important. Nothing was entertaining. And again, seeing Ember in the main event would be really cool if I knew that this meant something. But next week, you're either going to see her off of Raw or losing in some insignificant, nonsensical bullshit match. 50-50 booking is what Vince is best at. I just don't see how that's your main event. What? What's the... The main event is the, is the top of the line. The main thing you're looking forward to the whole night. The thing that interests you and excites you the most. The biggest cliffhanger for the following week. And it's Tamina Snuka in Nia Jax. Versus Ronda Rousey and a last minute partner in Ember Moon. Again, Rousey and Ember defeat Nia and Tamina. So all this building up of Nia and Tamina, by the way, gone. They've already lost. Ronda Rousey pins, or no, taps out Tamina. So that's cool to see. That's exactly how Tamina should be being used. Exactly how she is. Useless talent. So you have her tap out. But... You were just trying to build her as a beast, as much as of a joke that was. I saw the payoff now. She taps out Tamina. Tamina and Nia lose. We've already seen Ronda Rousey defeat Nia Jax. Disqualifications, this, that, you can fucking say whatever you want. She beat Nia Jax in the, in the past. I've seen all of these payoffs. Realistically, Nia Jax is not beating Ronda Rousey. If we're being believable here. If we're being realistic. So that was all the female segments last night, man. Uh, I just all over the place. I don't know what anything is for. None of it is exciting or entertaining or fun. Nothing is of interest. That's an issue. But when you look at the men's side of things... They are no better, if not worse, than the females. Where do you want to start? Uh, Drew McIntyre last night. Let's start there. Drew McIntyre actually gives another good performance on the microphone. Before I got here, everybody was complacent in the back, just collecting a paycheck, comfortable with their spot. Same thing Big Show said in a real interview just last week. That seems to be how the locker room is backstage. Everyone is just happy as fuck to be there collecting a paycheck. And you know it's true. Look at dipshit Xavier Woods. Playing video games all day. He's happy as fuck. 
He has his little up, up, left, right, up and down, all around channel, whatever the fuck it's called on YouTube. He's collecting that fucking side money. He's, he's giggling like a schoolgirl with all his little buddies and gals backstage. He's happy as fuck just to be somewhat relevant the last four or five years in WWE with this New Day gimmick. Because he knew he was a jobber waiting to happen. And he's got talent, by the way. I'm not dissing or bashing Woods just for no fucking reason. The guy's got talent. But he was heading toward jobber status for his entire career. They struck gold with New Day. And he's happy as fuck to be collecting a paycheck. I'm just using him as, him as an example. Because I tooled on him the other fucking day as well. Uh, for saying some dipshitted comments. But you could go and look at a lot of people. You know, Sasha and Bailey. I'm sure Sasha is frustrated deep down. Maybe Bailey is too. But at the beginning, I'm sure they were just happy as fuck. Uh, we're best friends traveling the world making money together. Back in the day, you had to earn your spot. And it was very political. And it was very cutthroat. And you were always trying to one-up the other person. And as much as that could create a toxic locker room, it also created some of the best characters. It made people raise the bar. It made them be better than they ever thought they could be. That's why you saw people grabbing those imaginary grapefruits and brass rings. Those brass rings became a reality back in the day. Because you had to really scratch and claw to be the best in the business. That's what you were there for. Even if you weren't getting the championships, you were trying to be one of the most talked about, the best. You were trying to put on the best performances. You were trying to think of how your character could be talked about and become the best it could be. Now, redundancy. And we can only blame booking and creative so much. Trust me, they're mostly to blame. But these wrestlers, they don't look like they're fucking putting any effort into this shit. Half the time. They're going out business as usual. I'm taking what the writing staff gave me. I'm taking Vince's direction. I'm not going outside the box at all. I'm not doing my own thing at all. Because shit, today's company, you might get fired. But I take that fucking chance. I'll take that chance in a heartbeat. Because that'll get me fucking noticed. That'll put me on the fucking map. And maybe, here's a concept, that'll earn you Vince McMahon's respect. Even if he flips out at you at first. Nobody is going outside the box. Everything is so mediocre and redundant every week in every segment. Everything just seems like it has no life behind it. No energy, no passion. I bring more passion on this channel and these videos than that product, Monday Night Raw, every week. That's fucking sad. That should not be happening. So McIntyre has a damn good promo. But what is this leading to with McIntyre? Where's the payoff? It's at TLC with Finn Balor. This is a Monday Night Raw redundancy match. So why is it at a fucking pay-per-view? But even more confusing, they have Dolph Ziggler come out. Now they're going to address this. Last week, they should have addressed it. And they didn't. And they just had Drew off on his own and Dolph never fucking mentioned anything. Dolph was just oh, it's fucking taking an open challenge from Seth Rollins. And then a week later, Dolph Ziggler's like, wait a second. We're no longer together? <laughs> and McIntyre's like, no. And he contradicts himself. He's like, I used you to get to the top. And I was the most fucking relevant thing in your career. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? You used him to get to the top. So you're saying he's one of the, the big dogs. And you're going to use him to help elevate you. But then immediately you're saying you were the most relevant thing for him. So which is it? Did he help you or did you help him? So they addressed this thing, finally, by the way, because this needed to be addressed. So I'm cool with it. And somehow, Dolph Ziggler ends up getting a zigzag on Drew McIntyre, and he goes to take off. So I'm like, okay, maybe they save this, man. We'll see what happens next week, and maybe you do something cool with Dolph and Drew. It started off good. I like that, I guess. A week too late. But maybe you can salvage it. And no, Corbin gets on the mic and says... 
Dolph, you ain't going anywhere. We're having a match right now. I'm like, no, what are you doing? You just are fucking doing all of this in one fucking shot? This goes to show you they never had anything for Dolph and Drew. They threw them together with no real plan. So they ended this all in one shot and they have a fucking match. Drew and Dolph. Nothing special. Uh, Drew was toying with him for the most part. Got on the microphone at one point and said, You know what? I still have a soft, a soft part in me for you, Dolph. So I'm going to treat you like somebody I don't like. I'm going to treat you like Finn Balor. And he starts whipping Dolph around some more. Finn Balor actually comes out to ringside. A little bit of a distraction. And while the referee's distracted, he actually uh, gives a fucking, I don't know what he did, a drop kick or some shit to Drew McIntyre on the outside. Referee never saw it. When McIntyre was able to beat the, the 10 count, he gets super kicked. One, two, three. Dolph Ziggler beats Drew McIntyre. So... Balor gets a little bit of revenge. Okay, but wasn't that what TLC was for? The dastardly deeds fucking you up, Drew McIntyre, and then at TLC you get the ultimate revenge. Or no, are they having Balor get revenge now and then it's McIntyre who goes over at TLC? Maybe that's where they're going. They're really going to strap the rocket onto Drew McIntyre. Possibly. I just felt like Throwing Dolph in there with Drew right there. I mean, you're just trying to wrap up the whole storyline in one swoop because you know you didn't have anything. It feels like a cop-out and it feels like the fans get cheated out of the last three fucking months of bullshit when you didn't even have a plan. So Ziggler defeats Drew McIntyre, but it was really because of the interference of Balor. So what does this really do for Dolph? He looks like, he looks weak in this. He didn't beat Drew McIntyre on his own. And by the way, is he now a face? I, what's Dolph? Is he still a heel? Is he now a face? Everybody else is turning. Elias kind of halfway turned. Although he kind of insulted Houston as well last night. But isn't he kind of a face now? Daniel Bryan's now a heel. Big Show once again turned back to a face. Because he turned on the bar. Uh, Nia Jax, once again, now is a heel. Um, Charlotte is kind of half and half. Who the fuck is who anymore? I don't even know. Apollo Crews is... is I, what's a Apollo? Apollo's a face now, I believe. Or he, was he already and he just separated from time? Who the fuck knows, man? Everybody is just... You gotta keep up with this shit. Who, what character is what? And Dave Meltzer, I'm gonna throw him a bone here. He said it best. He said, and then you wonder why there's no emotional attachment to these characters anymore. Because we can't be attached. They're, they're just every, they're swooping every which way because management, creative, booking, Vince McMahon, they're week to week, day by day, minute by minute. They don't know what they're doing. So if it fits their illogical bullshit every week, they're going to turn people. Just so it fits their, their, their story for that day, for that week. And then the next week, they'll change it. They'll worry about next week, next week. They don't know what they're doing long term anymore. And the people that should have turned, like the Romans, like the fucking Cenas, they stay 50-50 their entire career. Because they get noise. Here's a concept. Leave people the way they are and book them correctly. Give them awesome storylines that will develop into epic feuds that we want to see them in big spots and big matches at pay-per-views. That's how you help build the character within. No. We'll just flip them every other week and hope the crowd doesn't notice or just goes along with it. So that's the fucking McIntyre Ziggler. I don't know if that's... Maybe they have another match. Maybe this is the new match for Raw. That's another seven weeks in a row. Right through fucking Royal Rumble. We're going to see Dolph and Drew every week, maybe. Maybe that's the new Rollins and Dolph that we used to see every single fucking week. Um, Elias, uh, he's putting on a performance. And what was it? Fucking Bobby Lashley comes down with Leo Rush. 
Bobby Lashley starts posing, showing his fucking ass to the world again. I, if you don't watch Raw, you just watch these reviews. This sounds silly, but that's what's happening, guys. He's just showing his ass. Elias comes down to the ring to kick his ass. <laughs> uh, he's able to get the, the best of him. He throws Lashley into the LED boards. Um, I think Leo Rush went to run away, but here's Finn Balor again. So Balor is ruining everyone's parade, raining on everybody's parade. He stops Leo Rush. Leo Rush gets wailed in the back uh, by Elias' guitar. Shot her around the world. Fucking Elias, I'm sorry, fucking Leo Rush down. Not moving a muscle. Leo sold that beautifully. It was a pretty damn good guitar shot. Um, Lashley was nowhere to be found to help Leo. Lashley fucking ran after he got thrown into the LED boards. Or maybe he was still fucking knocked out, but I think he ran. Uh, Balor's left with that smile. He's always smiling. He's so happy, Finn Balor. How, how do you not take him seriously? It's Finn fucking Balor. I have no big issue with that Elias segment. If you're gonna have an Elias versus Lashley rematch again at TLC, I guess that's all you can do with them because you've done everything else. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna totally shit on that. I am gonna shit on the match at TLC because it's another fucking redundant rematch. Um, speaking of Finn Balor, he beats, uh, Jinder Mahal last night. Oh, <laughs> another match we've seen a thousand fucking times, but that's Monday Night Raw. Balor takes on Mahal. Balor wins the match against Mahal. Mahal is back in that jobber status that he was before he won the championship. I have no idea what the fuck happened to Mahal. Um... <laughs> And Finn Balor smiling again. Smiley Finn. It, my thing is... By the way, guys. Go back and watch that. That crowd in Houston was on their feet. Excited and into it. Counting the one, two, three even. For Balor and Mahal. I have no... Evidently, they love that shit. I, I watched it. I didn't see what was so epic. Correct me if I'm wrong down below. What did I miss in that match, guys? That... The crowd was on their fucking feet. Was it because Apollo Crews came out? Apollo Crews helped Balor and took out the Singh brothers. That's what brought them to their feet? Or maybe they just really love Finn Balor, man. I have no idea. I just know that the demon character is so fucking badass. And for everyone that said, oh, but BC, man, it's a specialty character, so you can't use it all the time. Realize this, guys. This is a fact. He used that character, the demon, one time in 2018. One time the entire year. That is not a specialty. That's just being stupid. The demon is one of the best characters in pro wrestling. Use that shit. Instead, we're getting Smiley Finn. Pop collar, smiles. He's got his rainbow socks. And people fucking do love it. They're cheering the shit out of the motherfucker. <laughs> no matter how mid-card this motherfucker is placed in by Vince, he still gets to cheer. That's because we generally like Finn. My point is, when you make him the demon, he becomes a legit threat. He becomes relevant. We look at him as... one of the top fucking guys in the business. When he was the demon, he collected the Universal Championship. When he's the demon, he's undefeated. When he's pop top collar Finn, smiley Finn, rainbow Finn, he's 50-50 at best. What the fuck are we... How special is the... Once a year, guys? Then I don't want it to be special anymore. Let him just be the fucking demon and let's see where that goes. I bet you that'll turn into something special. I don't need to see this motherfucker once a year as the demon. He should be showing up to major pay-per-views at least as the demon. Three or four times at least as the demon. Come on, bro. Ah, what else last night, man? Is that everything, man? Heath Slater and Rhino... Corbin had them go out there, and whoever loses that match, this is a, a tag team, supposedly. We don't see them ever. Heat Slater and Rhino, and whoever wins, they get to keep their job. The loser, they're fired from Raw. So Rhino looked like he was going to win in this four-minute match at best. Maybe it was three minutes. 
Uh, but Heath Slater pulls out the victory. So Rhino is no longer a part of Raw. Does this mean he's retired? Does this mean he's just leaving Raw and going to SmackDown? Does this just mean he wants time off? Who knows? Uh, there's reports that during the commercial break, he said bye like he's retiring. So we don't know. Um, Heath Slater backstage asked Corbin, Hey man, is there any way we could just let Slater keep his job? Anything we can do? I'm, I'm sorry, fucking Rhino keep his job? And Corbin's like, yeah, there is something you could do. You could do your job, which is this. And he hands him a referee shirt. And Corbin laughs and says, what? You didn't think I was going to keep you around as a wrestler, right? You're useless doing that. But maybe there's a long career for you as a referee. So Heath Slater is now a referee. This could lead to something cool in the future if they're going to set something up for Heath. So we'll see, man. Or maybe Heath Slater's really going to be an official now. Who knows? Uh, that would be kind of funny. Um, what else, man? I, I don't... Gable? Gable and fucking... Uh, Bobby Roode, that's what it was. Corbin tells Bobby Roode that if you could beat Drake, Drake Maverick tonight, you and Gable will get another shot at the AOP. Well, that's because there's no more fucking tag teams left. So obviously they're going to get another shot. They're going to get 20 more shots. So back backstage, while Maverick and Roode are in the ring, backstage... AOP jumps Gable, and Corbin goes, you know what, I changed my mind, it's now a three-on-two match, Gable and Rude versus the AOP and Maverick, so I'm like, well, how do you, what, that makes zero, you just said it was one up, so AOP goes to the ring, they demolish Bobby Rude, Gable's able to come back to the ring, but to no avail, AOP keeps demolishing Gable and Rude, and there's a hot tag. <laughs> it's a hot tag by Maverick. He's ready to fucking take on anyone. But Rude is already down and out. So Sp Sp Spike Dudley. Fuck. <laughs> Sp Spike. What the fuck am I talking about? Drake Maverick drops on the Bobby Rude. One, two, three. And AOP and Drake Maverick defeat. Or it's really Drake Maverick defeats Bobby Rude. How do you not feel bad for Bobby Rude, man? How much lower do you... And, and Gable, just stuck in a tag team, still getting nowhere. AOP, stuck with Drake Maverick. I don't even... The tag team division, guys. And as I mentioned earlier, the Lucha Summer Panada Party. One of them was supposed to take on uh, Scott Dawson last night. And JoJo's just like, this match will be under... Lucha fucking Panada rules, or whatever it's called, which means all three are going to take on Scott Dawson. That's called a handicap match. That's not Lucha fucking underground Libra Panada rules. That's called a handicap match. And if that's the case, then why doesn't fucking Dash Wilder get in there as well? No, he's not allowed. This makes zero sense. So this Panada Party defeats Scott Dawson. Again, the Revival gets beat by the Panada Party. We've been seeing this every week in every different way you can think of. But it doesn't make sense. It's clueless and everyone keeps saying, oh, it's fucking entertaining though, right, Renee? And Renee's like, yeah, yeah, it is entertaining. Right, Corey? And Corey's like, no. L at least Corey's saying no. <laughs> but Michael Cole and Renee Young are being fed these lines. Tell them it's entertaining and that's all that matters. Entertaining to who? People dumb as fuck? People stupid as fuck? People that have been dropped on their head way too many times when they were babies? Maybe that's fucking entertaining to them. You know, I like Baron Corbin, man. I really do. You guys know that. He, this character, I feel, has a lot more personality than the old Baron Corbin. The old Corbin, we didn't give a fuck about. Whether you like him or hate him now, at least he has more personality and he's got a character. So, and in this one, he's always changing the rules and being the dastardly deed to make sure that everything goes in his favor. So I like that. That's what he should be doing. But when you make things so not realistic and so not believable and things are happening or being changed, that shouldn't be because now you're questioning the integrity of the actual sports entertainment company itself or the sport itself in pro wrestling. That's what I have a problem with. Even though it's pro wrestling, you still want to believe that this shit is legit, right? You want to still believe in what you're fucking watching. You can't just make rules like that, man. And you know, and especially when this doesn't favor Baron Corbin. You can see if this was a dastardly deed fucking thing being done by Corbin. 
and these Panada Party people are part of Corbin's stable. But they're not. So Corbin's not going out of his way to say this is a handicap match. So who's making these rules? So the Panada people are just going out there and saying this is what we're doing. So say it. And that's the final verdict? They get to make their own match? Who's doing that? Is Vince that much into the Panada party that behind the scenes we're going to find out that Vince is making the decisions? This is stupid, guys. It just is because it makes no sense and you can't tell me that it does. You can't tell me a viable explanation of why this is happening. Now, I always said from the beginning, on the main roster, the Revival will never get over. I stand behind that. It's just not going to happen. But the Revival should not be looking like clowns every week, man. Do something with them or send them back to NXT or get rid of them. As much as you don't want to see people losing their job, at this point, if you're not going to do anything with them and they're just going to be losers, then get rid of them. How the fuck you keep to the, uh, who's Connor and Victor? What is their tag team name, man? The fucking, uh, I don't even fuck, they're so irrelevant, I fucking forgot what they are. Uh, whoever Victor and Connor was, man, how they still have a fucking job is beyond me. And they'll keep these guys for fucking years when they're useless. At least the Revival can put on some good matches, I understand that. They're still not going to go over with the main roster, but they can put on good matches. So maybe they are just the live event utility guys that Vince likes. They're the workhorses that'll go out on the live shows and put on the matches, I understand. But don't make them clown out every single week to Panada people. It's fucking ridiculous. Uh, the best segment of the night for me was Dean Ambrose and Rollins. This is the only real match I'm looking forward to for TLC. Uh, the most, I should say. Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, I'm not sure what to expect there. We've seen a couple of their matches. I feel they should be much better. I think their TLC match, if given enough time, is going to be their best. But I don't know. Um, I'm looking forward to it a tad, but not as much as Rollins and Ambrose. I think this is going to be the best Rollins and Ambrose match you've seen in a long fucking time. Um, and then you have Asuka, Charlotte, Becky. I don't know how you're going to be able to top Becky and Charlotte from the last pay-per-view. What the fuck was that called? Sorry, guys. I don't even know where the fuck my head's at. Where was that? What are we in? Uh, September, October, November, November. Survivor Series? No, Survivor Series was out October. What the fuck was that? Evolution! Wow, that was going to bug me. This was going to be a two-hour video, guys. Until I found out what it was. I think it was Evolution where Becky Lynch and Charlotte had that awesome fucking match. Where tables, ladders, and chairs were all brought into the match. So I don't know even throwing Asuka if that's going to be able to top that. We have to see. A little bit intrigued. We'll see. It's Rollins and Ambrose that really, I know what I'm going to get from these two, and I know it's going to deliver. So, it's cool to see Dean Ambrose out of the fucking vaccination segments last week, because that was so fucking cringeworthy, and now Dean Ambrose is actually cutting a promo. I love the sirens at the first part of that segment. Before Ambrose comes out of the ring, all these sirens are coming out, these guys are coming out to his security with gas masks, you got Dean Ambrose coming down in a gas mask. Um, and he starts cutting a promo with the mask on. You can't really hear him, so he eventually takes the mask out. And he cuts a rather good promo. He starts insulting Houston. Uh, he starts insulting Seth Rollins. He starts talking about how he has a bigger moral compass than everybody else. Even though everybody else wants to down him for what he did to Rollins. He's really the one who's got the moral compass. He's the one who's making the right choices. Not all of you. And how egotistical... And how much he always wanted to have his way was Seth Rollins. And he had enough of it. So I like the promo. We all know Dean Ambrose can deliver if you give him the time. This sends out Seth Rollins and we have another Rollins-Ambrose brawl. I like the way this was done because Ambrose tried to escape up the crowd like we've seen before. But this time Seth Rollins was able to catch him. So now we have a brawl. After that pretty damn good promo, we got a brawl. In the crowd between Rollins and Ambrose, it leaks back into the arena area, the ringside area, I should say, my bad. And the security now is now in. Or is that before? Or one of the two, the security gets their asses whooped by Seth Rollins. One by one, thrown out of the ring, one of them gets fucking thrown, powerbomb form, into all the other security on the outside, over the top rope. That was pretty fucking cool. Ambrose gets the upper hand, starts attacking Seth Rollins. Um... 
And that was that. Ambrose ends off with the final say. I like that man, you know? The brawls makes it realistic. For some superstars in their feud, you can't have them brawling every week. I understand that. For Rollins and Ambrose, you can. Because you believe that every time they see each other, they want to rip each other's head off. So I like that. This makes sense. Every time they see each other, they should be beating the fuck out of each other. Next week, they should be beating the fuck out of each other in the parking lot. In the parking lot. Let that shit leak out into the street. That is what should be happening. So that was the best segment of the night, no doubt. So, as a whole, guys, I'm going to stop because I don't want to fucking trigger Xavier Woods anymore. He's probably got Biggie and Kofi calming him down right now because we're being entitled infants and we're complaining about the product. We're critiquing it and it's not all positive. Poor Xavier. Relax, buddy. Uh, Biggie, put on his video games. That's right, Kofi. Make sure it's Mortal Kombat. Finish him. Get over here. Xavier will be fine. Put on his little bib. Put on his video games. He'll he'll record for his up, up, sideways, all around channel. You'll be fine, Xavier. So we'll stop critiquing so Xavier doesn't throw a fit. That was Monday Night Raw, guys. Was it better than last week? Absolutely. But again, just a fraction of a bit better. Just a little bit better. And I mean a little bit better. But if you think I'm throwing them a bone because they're a little bit better... Absolutely not. If you look at what they do with Rollins and Ambrose, think about this, guys. And I left this on my Twitter just fucking yes last night, actually. Right after that segment, I left this on my Twitter and I said, if WWE just dedicated enough time, creativity, and passion to even three or four segments, three or four feuds during a whole three hour Raw, that's all I'm asking for. Beggars can't be choosers. I won't ask for much. Three or four segments that we really give a shit about those feuds. Three or four. That'll be a good show. I promise you. Even with all the, f- the filler, if you gave us four shit, sometimes I'll be fine with three really good feuds that you actually gave a lot of creativity to. It's a good show. That's the problem I'm trying to tell you guys. It's not just coming on here bitching, complaining, being negative. Guys, it's that they literally, most weeks, most weeks, dedicate no segments to an epic story or feud. Last night we had one, Ambrose and Rollins. What if you did that for more superstars? What if you gave more superstars really cool stories? Really cool feuds? Let them build up their characters to where we invest in the character. And we are emotionally attached to them. Because they're bringing out emotion. They're bringing out our fucking... Our our own passion for them. For this business. But they don't do it anymore. They don't give them the time of day to do such. Everything seems to be filler, guys. If you watch a three-hour Raw television show, you know what you're getting, guys? Segment after segment after segment after segment after segment after segment. It's on to the next. That one's done. Let's move on. That one's done. Let's move on. That one's done. Let's move on. Even when something really epic does happen, they stick with it for a second, and then they cut to Michael Cole and Corey and Renee at the broadcast booth. They're like, wow, that was just amazing. But moving on. WWE has teamed up with Susan G. And I'm like, what the fuck? Let that shit breathe. Even though you're not ending the show yet, fade the black, go to commercial. Everything is just on to the next. Everything seems like filler. And it's because most shit is just filler. There's no epic segments or epic feuds to give a shit about anymore. Ambrose and Rollins showed you that that's what they can give you If they let them go out there and give them the time of day to do such. That's all I'm asking. Three or four of those type of feuds and a whole show. But I'm asking too much. I'm an entitled infant. I'm just a fucking complainer. Fucking A, man. That was Monday Night Raw, guys. I want to give a sincere thank you to everybody that tuned into my last video. 
Um, it was just an impromptu video with my response to what Xavier Woods called wrestling fans that critiqued the product. And wrestling fans that are not always positive. Apparently, he doesn't want us to have a voice if it's negative. And it boggles his mind. And he calls us names. So I have a response for Xavier Woods. It was supposed to be an impromptu video. Um, it ended up being, uh... A very successful fucking video, man. Uh, I was blown away by the response. And I knew it was going to be a hot topic. I knew a lot of content creators were not going to touch this subject because it's too controversial. They don't want to get on the bad side of Xavier Woods fans. Or they don't want to really combat uh, the actual wrestlers because maybe they have a bigger fan base and they're afraid that that fan base will get on their ass. I don't know. Um, but I'm not afraid of any of that shit. I am the most controversial content creator, at least on this platform. So I knew it was my duty to make that video because I knew new nobody else was going to. And uh, I just didn't think it was going to be that successful. Um, so thank you guys so fucking much, man. That was a huge video. And again, that was just my last video that I made um, before this past weekend. And that was... My response to Xavier Woods. If you didn't catch it, check it out. But judging by that response, you probably already caught it. So I just wanted to thank you guys so much. Because again, that was impromptu, man. I didn't expect that type of response. Much love. Uh, right back to you guys as you shown it to me. Uh, we'll go on to SmackDown tonight. Uh, SmackDown should be better than Raw, but that's not saying much. Um, we're headed toward TLC. So again, like I say before pay-per-views, there's no time for mulligans. SmackDown has to come out here and whack that son of a bitch out of the park a grand slam tonight. Capitalize on what Raw is doing horrible and horribly. Capitalize on that shit. I believe SmackDown will deliver tonight. At least I'm hoping so, man. But that Raw was just a minor fraction better than last week. I guess you could look at it as a step in the right direction, but who's to say Monday Night Raw isn't back even worse next week? Who's to fucking say? Because Vince and WWE has not done anything to show us that they can put together consistency. Any type of consistency with their programming. At least not in a positive light. So you want me to be more positive? How about we start with Vince and that company putting together shows... I don't even like calling it because they're not even fucking entertaining. But how about we start with Vince and WWE putting together solid, good, doesn't even have to be great yet. Let's just start with good shows. And then people like the Amplified Man will be more positive. And I'll be in front of this camera on these videos being like Finn Balor, smiling my ass off. Maybe I'll even pop my collar a little more. Amplified Man, coffees and ass whippings, Starbucks. Get those lattes ready! The Amplified Man saying, you check it later!